Good morning, everyone. So this presentation is going to be like in English and Spanish, depending on my brain, how it's working. Uh, because sometimes I'm trying to find the words in English and I'm sometimes trying to find the words in Spanish. So in order for me to continue the conversation, I need to like code switch um, in order for me. Um, after I finished my master's degree, I went to work for KIPP um, as a high school teacher. And I taught um, AP Spanish Lang, Spanish 4, and AP Spanish Lit. Um, then I was uh, the department chair for both high schools, and I was writing curriculum for Spanish 1, 2, and 3. Uh, in the kids' school, we have three courses for students that are non-native, and then we have one course that is Spanish 4 for, native, uh, for heritage speakers, and then AP Lang, um, AP Lang and AP Lit for heritage um, speakers. So we have currently two um, high schools, and I decided to present because I'm very passionate about instructional material. Um, I like to help my um, team, which is the Spanish team, because they're always creating the wheel, and there is no material for them. So I'm always trying to find materials for them that they can use, um, because we, we don't have materials. Uh, also, I decided to present because my dissertation is going to be an empirical study and I'm going to be working with a high school teacher and I'm going to be working with the students uh, trying to implement um, a pedagogical approach in how to teach pragmatics explicitly to high school students. So that's why I decided to, to present this. So hopefully it's helpful for you. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to stop me at any point. So my presentation is um, titled Students as Creators, Gen Rabe's Instruction in High School for Heritage Speakers. And it's going to sound a little bit as the presentation that Karen did yesterday. Um, when she was saying things, I was like making connections and said like, oh, <laughs> it's almost uh, similar, but there is some differences and the differences um, for AP Lang and for AP Lit, um, especially for AP Lit, students have a required list. So it's not what they want to read, right? Uh, so how to encourage the students to read a text from the 14th century, which sometimes is difficult for adults. So how to create that sense of, um, I want to read Don Quixote, or I want to read Lazarillo de Tormes, uh, when the teacher is like, oh, I don't want to read that. So that's going to be the difference between Karen's um, presentation and my presentation. So I would like for somebody to volunteer to read this. I would like to acknowledge um, the land and we are standing right now. So if I have a volunteer, that I can read this. So these are the materials that you are going to need for this section. If you have your phones, uh, you can scan the QR code. You are going to find the presentation and all the handouts that you are going to need, but also it's in the folder uh, that Jocelyn shared with you. So all the materials are there, but also are here. Yeah, it's the same. So these are all the materials that you are going to need for this. So these are the objectives for today. The participants will be able to name the instructional steps of gender-based instruction. The participants will be able to apply their knowledge on gender-based instruction to complete two instructional steps for an upcoming lesson. This is the agenda. Uh, we're going to start with a do now, o calentamiento. Um, that's what we do in high school uh, here in Cuba. <laughs> uh, background, uh, back, back, backward planning, sorry. First and second core ideas, the third idea, general based instruction and models. And then you are going to have um, planning time to apply what you uh, hear me say. And then at the end, I always like to collect data, um, which is my nature. Uh, so I would like for you to complete a survey and how was my presentation, if it was helpful or not, so I can make changes or adapt it uh, for future presentations. So we're going to start with this. And uh, we're going to watch this video, and this is the transcript of the video. So as you watch the video, think about the question below, how this is related to education. Be ready to be called call to share your answer. Hi. 
how that relates to education. Take 30 seconds to think about this question, how this video relates to education. Take 30 seconds. Um, I would say, like, have the end on mind, right? Like, if you know what the students need to know at the end of the semester, what the students need to do at the end of the semester, so you are actually planning, thinking about the rigor that your class needs to have um, every single day. So thinking about the end goal, thinking about what is your goal, playing the role of facilitator, like, this is my goal, how I'm going to get there, uh, and what activities I'm going to pr provide for the students to have a diverse view of the world, and not just one, one side of, of the story. So we're going to talk about backwards planning. So if you have the goal in mind, you know, like, what do students need to know and do at the end of the course, then you are going to think about the assessments. So how I'm going to check that they are on track to meet that goal, right? And the path is not going to be straight. So when you climb a mountain, there's a lot of obstacles, and probably you are going to take a long time or short time, and maybe you are going to take shortcuts or not. So it depends on your ability and um, guiding the students and facilitating the road for them so they can be successful. Then uh, you are going to plan their learning experience, uh, experiences, which activities will help the students reach that goal. So starting with the goal, then with the assessments, and then the learning experiences. So if you are going to assess the students in one way, those are the same um, ways that you are going to use in your learning experience. You can ask the students to always answer open-ended questions, and then during the practice, is um, during the assessment, sorry, is multiple choice. So it has to align what you are creating as assessment with the learning experiences and the goal that you have in mind. So we're going to start with the first core idea. So if you look at the mountain, we're going to start with the goal, what the students need to know and do at the end of the course. So that is our first core idea. And those are the learning outcomes. So for high school, we can either follow any of these three things here in Texas. Uh, if you are not from Texas, maybe you follow the ACPO or you follow the um, standards from your state. So these are some examples of the skills or learning outcomes that the students need to have. Obviously, it's only one, but the students need to have um, a variety of skills at the end of the course for them to be successful. For an AP college board, is the one that we are going to follow uh, for advanced placement courses. And one of the learning outcomes is analyze and or interpret literary, literary uh, text and audio sources in the target language. ACTFO, uh, one example is learners understand, interpret, and analyze what is heard, read, or view on a variety of topics. And then for the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, uh, analyze culturally authentic print, digital audio, and audiovisual materials in a variety of contexts. So, like I said, this is just an example of the skills that the students need to have at the end of the course. So, if you know the learning outcomes, you know how to guide the students throughout the year and prepare materials that are aligned with this skill. So, the second core idea is assessment. So you need to think about what is going to be the assessment or what the assessment looks like at the end of the year. For example, for AP Spanish Lang or AP Spanish Lit, the students need to write an essay, the students need to answer multiple choice questions, the students need to listen to audios and answer questions. So those are the things that you need to keep in mind when you are preparing the learning experiences for the students. Then you need to think about how many skills are you going to assess throughout the year. So you are thinking about, okay, at the end of the year, the students need to have 25 skills. How am I going to divide those 25 skills throughout the year so the students feel successful at the end of the course? And then think about the alignment between the learning outcomes, the assessments, and the learning experience in the classroom. Are all of them aligned? 
uh, if they are not aligned, then the students are not going to be successful at the end of the course. Also thinking about assessments, what is the difference between performance and proficiency? What, what are the two categories that you are actually assessing? And if the students are aware which one you are assessing, it is important to be clear with the students presenting the why, uh, why we are doing this, where we are going with this um, skill. The third core idea, and this one is the one that we're going to spend the most, because this um, workshop is about genre-based instruction. And genre-based instruction is a pedagogical framework that I use to create learning experience, not only for high school students, but also for college students. So genre-based instruction is a pedagogical framework that provides instructor, instructors with a series of instructional steps that not only allow students to learn how different kind of texts are structured, but also to understand what their social purpose is and how linguistic and rhetorical features are tied to the particular message that the author wishes to convey. This framework allows the students to create their own content using different modalities based on the structure of the model text. I'm going to show you examples and I'm going to give you some time to digest all the things that come with this framework. So let's do this activity. Take two minutes to stand up and then find a partner that is two, table, two tables from you. Like Jocelyn is going to go to the third table. The third table is going to go to the fifth table. The fifth table is going to go to the seventh table. So you need to stand up and then find a partner and discuss these questions. What comes to your mind when you hear the word tech? What is the first thing that comes to your mind? And then be ready to share your answers with the group at the end of the two minutes. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, so. Okay, before you start, can, can everybody sit down for a second? <laughs> Thank you. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I forgot to tell you. So, and, and I put usually in the slides, you need to wait until I say go. Okay, <laughs> so. <laughs> Take two, exactly. Take two minutes to stand up and find a partner, two tables from you, and discuss the following question. What comes to your mind when you heard the word text? Okay, so Jocelyn is going to go to a person that is in this table. One person. The table here is going to go to the one person that is in this table. Two tables from you. So I'm going to check for understanding before you move. Who can tell me what you are going to do and how you are going to do it? Uh huh. And what you are going to do? Uh -huh. How many? T how much time do you have? Yes. Perfect. So. Yeah. When I say go, go. Two minutes. So one thing that high school teachers do it's like when the students are an activity we we'll walk around and hear what the students are saying and then we pick up somebody um, based on the responses to share but I was um, having some difficulties with the mic so I couldn't hear what you were saying but is there a volunteer that can tell me what comes to your mind when you hear the boy and uh, the word text so yes yes so a text can be, in this room, there is a lot of things that we can analyze, right? Like, why the clock was put there and not in this wall or in this wall? Why it has to be on the back? Why we are using this kind of tables instead of other kind of tables? Like the functionality of the table, because we are in a conference room, right? So all the things that are in this classroom can be used as a text and can be, um, you can discover other things. Like she was saying, 
you can talk about the history of the table. You can talk about the family. Why families go around, or why, like, at least in my family, even though we have a very nice living room, everybody's always in the, in the kitchen. For some reason, everybody's in the kitchen, and everybody's standing up. Like, there is a lot of chairs while you are not sitting down, while you are in the kitchen, right? So those are the things that you can talk about, and then you can analyze, um, especially when you are with high schoolers or college students. Um, so text, the evolution of the word text, um, according with David and Carmen, text can no longer be thought as a relative fixed and stable. It doesn't fit a reality. Our students are, the high school students are in TikTok, right? They are not in Twitter and not in Facebook because that's for old people. So they are just in TikTok, in Instagram. Um, so those are the texts for them. They are getting the information from this media. They are not getting the information the information for, from Don Quixote in the book of 500 pages. They are getting the information um, from fluid um, media. So this is the definition that came up that fits the reality that our students are living right now. In addition, they are becoming increasingly multimodal and interactive. So you can mix, you can do an audio and you can do a text, or you can do a text and you can do an image, a visual. So you can um, interchange the uh, modalities that you are presenting the, uh, the text to the student. Uh, links between texts are complex online, and intertextuality is common in online texts as people draw open and fly with other texts available in the web. So these are the instructional steps uh, of general-based instruction. So if I go back to the definition, so there are two things that I want to point out. So social instructional steps, social purpose, and text, okay? So the students are going to interact with different texts, and they are going to understand the structure, the internal and external uh, structure of the text. We're talking about external uh, structure of the text. We're talking about how many paragraphs, uh, if it has a thesis, if it has a conclusion. We're talking about the internal structure of the text. We're talking about the grammar. So this framework helps the students understand not only the external structure of the text, but also the internal structure, and then what is the social purpose of that text. So that being said, these are the instructional steps of genre-based instruction. So there are five steps, but usually teachers only use four. Um, because the fifth, sometimes it doesn't get time during the year for the students to complete the fifth one, but it can be an activity that you can do with the students if you teach them five days a week. Uh, in the high school that I work um, with, they only have four days, the students, because Wednesday and Thursday is a block day. So it is a little bit challenging to do the whole cycle in a week, uh, when they have a lot of things that they need to internalize for their AP test. So the first step is setting the context. Building field, experiencing the known and the new. How we are going to get our students to be interested in Don Quixote, to be interested in Lazarillo de Torment, to be interested in things that were written in the 14th century. Then we are going, uh, the second step in the instructional steps is modeling and the construction. What is the meaning of this text? What is the main idea? What is the purpose? What is the message? The third step is joint construction, where the students are working together with the teacher to go back to the model text and to replicate it. So they learn the model text, the internal and the external structure. And then in the joint construction, they work with partners to replicate the model text. 
when they go to the individual construction, they do a text that is similar, that has the same characteristic, but it can be presented in a different way. So if I give them a model text as a one paragraph of, some, of a narrative, they can create a poster, they can create a podcast, they can create a tweet, they can create a TikTok video. It has, it has to have the same internal and external um, organization like the model text. So that's where they get creative. And this is where the inclusion and the um, ownership comes into. Like, they are going to be agents of this um, content, and they create their own content. So how the instructional steps of general-based instruction looks like in a lesson plan? Yes, this looks very easy, right? Like, four steps, we can do it. But then how it looks like. And I think many of the presentations that we go in, they tell us these are the four steps and they don't give us a model and that's also what happened in the classroom, right? We tell the students, just do those four steps and they don't have a model. So they feel that they are not successful because they don't have something to relate to, to have, to get inspiration. Like yesterday, one of the presenters said, I'm going to show you a model so you have inspiration. Right? Inspiration and how to do things on your own, but you have a baseline. So do you remember the QR code that um, I show you with all the materials? And then also in the folder that Jocelyn shared with you, you should have access to the models. So you are going to find um, a landing page. The landing page looks like this. Here in the landing page, you have all the links that you are going to need. So go to this page. When you are there, we're going to, I'm going to show you two models, okay? The first one is for L2, and it's for novice high, and the second one is a model for heritage language learners. So if you go to the landing page, Click on the first one that says Model General Based Instruction Weekly Lesson for Novice High. And this is a lesson for L2 students. So when you click in that link, you are going to find this. Okay, I created a weekly lesson that is distributed in four classes of 15 minutes. So the first thing that I did is thinking about the end goal that we talked about at the beginning. When you, do, and we, when you listen to the video and she was asking, where do we go? And the cat asked her, where do you want to go? Well, I don't know, then it doesn't matter. So if we have an end goal for our students, then it's going to be easier for us to create the activities that are going to be aligned with that goal. So the first thing that I did is think about how this activity is going to align with the final assessment that the students are going to take at the end of the year. So the students are going to describe at the end of the year a picture, okay? And they are going to use the verbs ser, estar, haber y tener in different sections of the test. So this activity actually covers this thing. So it is aligned. And the way that I'm presenting the activities here is the same way that it's going to be presented in the final assessment. Then, after I think about the alignment with the final assessment, I put the proficiency level, the type of text that I'm going to use, and the I can statements from Apple. So this one is the first class. Setting the context. So I know that I'm going to talk about description. And the text that I'm going to use describe a haunted house. It's a manual for haunted houses. So the students are going to be very excited about this. 
So the first thing that I do is I'm going to connect the first with what they know and what we are going to be talking about in the story. So I ask them, describe your house, how it is, how many bedrooms do you have, how many bathrooms, do you have a garage, do you have a patio? So in this one, I was tempted to do cochera, right? Because that's the way that I say. I'm from Mexico and I say cochera. But then I'm thinking about the population that I'm teaching and I'm thinking that can be a cognate for the students. So it would be easy for them to use that. So why, why shouldn't use that, right? And I'm using tiene right here because it's a verb that they are going to be using in the lesson as well. So as I am creating my lesson, I'm also thinking how I'm going to economize my words because these are L2 students and I want them to practice the target language, but I also want them to understand and not feel frustrated. So these are the things that they should already know and they are very easy to answer. Then I do the modeling. But before doing the modeling, I introduce the unknown words through sentences. Here, I just put one example. So what I do is I pick up the vocabulary that I know is going to be essential for them to understand the text. And then I put it in a sentence that is going to be very relatable to their age. So many of them read Harry Potter, so they are going to make a connection maybe uh, what encantadas me. After that, I read the story to them. And this is the story. Manual de Casas Encantadas. It's a very short story, very funny, and the students love it. Usually I use this in October because it's close to Halloween, so it's also thematic uh, for them. So these two activities, uh, setting the context, modeling and deconstruction, I do it the first day on Monday. And then if you see here the comprehension questions, I do true and false because in the final assessment they are going to have true and false and they are also going to have open-ended questions. So I'm, I'm aligning my questions to the final assessment. So when the students are taking the final assessment, they feel familiar with the type of questions that they are going to have. All of these, they do it on Monday. So on Tuesday, they are going to do this one. We're going to talk about the external structure of the text. How is organized? What is the purpose? What kind of text is this? I put this in English, and we talk about this. Um, some of the presenters talk about this. I want them to know this and feel comfortable in their language. So it doesn't have to be in Spanish. Because what I want them to remember is the structure of the text, how it's organized, and then the purpose. So they can tell me these um, things in English because I want them to remember. So when they create their own content, they feel very comfortable and very confident that they can replicate the structure of the text that I just presented. Then here, I'm going to be um, doing the join construction, and this is for Wednesday. So it takes quite um, some time for the internal and external structure of the text, so I don't want to rush it. So I do it in one day, and then I also use this book that is in, um, in the UT um, website in Coral. Yeah, under Coral, this text, um, Dr. Zapata create this text for the students to have some exercises so they go and do their exercises and then I can see, I can use it almost like an exit ticket to collect data if they're actually understanding the verbs that are in the text. Then on Wednesday, I do the join construction and then on Thursday, I do the apply creative. And if you read there, what they are going to do is they are going to create a text that is new, but has the same organization and has the same verb, verbs as the model text. 
So they have to use at least two modes of communication. They can do video and audio, they can do visuals, audio and text, they can do a combination, but it has to be at least two. So I give them um, the rubric that I'm, how I'm going to grade them, and then I also give them the opportunity to revise it or do peer review so they understand what they have to do. So I know I talk a lot. So what I want you to do is go through this with your elbow partner and discuss this. What is the role of the text in the lesson? What are some similarities and differences between the lesson? Don't answer that question yet because we're going to see it in a second. We just answer question one and question three. What is the role of the text in the lesson? And how is the grammar introduced and taught? So I'm going to repeat the instructions. You are going to have five minutes to talk to your elbow partner about the lesson that I just presented. You are going to review it with your elbow partner and you are going to answer questions one and three. Who can repeat what you are going to do in the next five minutes? Maybe it sounds silly like, why do I have to repeat what she's saying? It is in the screen. But trust me, the students need to verbalize that to understand that. It seems very simple, very silly, but I have been in high school classroom. I was a former high school teacher. I am a college teacher right now. And trust me, I repeat this two times. And then I start walking around and there is five students that, what we are doing? I just say it twice and it's in the screen. Look at the screen. So it is silly, but it is muscle memory for you to remember like, I understand because I created, but maybe the, people that is in the room or the students don't understand it, so they have to verbalize it. That's how, that's why I'm doing it. I'm not doing it to be like, oh, they don't know what they are going to do. I know that you know. It's just for you to build muscle memory, to know, like, no assume that the students know what to do, even though you repeat it. Okay? So, five minutes on the clock. I heard a lot of great ideas. So, who is ready to share? Yes. Exacto, sí. Y hay muchos temas de gramática que se pueden utilizar, ¿verdad? No, no son los únicos. Se puede ir de regreso a otra lección y se puede utilizar el mismo texto para otra lección diferente de gramática. Sí, exacto. Entonces, no solamente es usar un texto, ya hice la lección, entonces tengo que usar otro texto. No, es, no necesariamente tienes que usar un texto diferente cada vez que haces una lección. Puedes utilizar el mismo texto para hacer tres lecciones, ¿verdad? Y lo que estábamos hablando, cuando están en el paso de hacer la construcción individual, ahí realmente te das cuenta si pueden aplicar los conceptos. Porque de un texto escrito, pasarlo a un video que tenga la misma estructura interna y externa, eso requiere mucha habilidad. Requiere que entiendas lo que estás haciendo. Y si no lo entiendes, no vas a poder crear algo que tenga la misma estructura. Okay. Pero entonces allí, la, cuando hacen el video, pongamos el ejemplo de un texto uh -huh. ellos se van a basar, vamos a decir, un, lo que quiere el maestro es que se basa en uno de los conceptos gramaticales que hemos enseñado, se le da esa opción al estudiante que escoja uno de los conceptos gramaticales, o más bien que, que, que expliquen todos los elementos gramaticales. That is up to you, right? Like we talked about this um, yesterday. All these materials are for you to adapt it to your student population. This works for my students this semester. Maybe it doesn't work for next semester, right? Because no, all the time I have L2 in, um, in Texas A&M. Sometimes I have mixed. I have heritage speakers that want to be in that class because they are afraid to be in the heritage speaker class. They just don't want to be there. They say, please don't send me there. I'm going to do everything here. And I said, like, it's fine. Like, you are going to be able to apply things that maybe you think that you understand, but you don't. So it's going to be helpful for you, the class, as well. So you can stay. You don't have to go if you don't feel comfortable. 
But, um, but when I have a mix, then I have to adapt the, the activities to give all the students um, the rigor that they deserve. Because it's not about lowering the rigor to meet the students' needs, but it's about giving them the proper tools for them to succeed with the same level of rigor. Okay, so let's quickly look at the AP um, lesson before I give you some time to plan. So if you go to the same landing page, you are going to go to the model that says AP Spanish Lit for AP and Heritage Language Learners. And it's the same um, pedagogical framework but looks different it has all the components. So it has the five steps that we went through in the other one. In the other one, it's more explicit, but in this one, it's implicit, but it has all the elements. So the students have to read uh, one of the required um, texts is from Pablo Neruda. So I decided to do La Oda, Los Calcetines. Odas are very fun and a very fun way to introduce things. Um, so that's why I decided to introduce the Oda on Los Calcetines with these students. And these students are in 11th grade, and they have to take the AP test at the end of the year. So I put all the things that they are going to be learning in this lesson, but also thinking about the AP test. What are the skills that they need uh, to have in order to pass the test? So I put this one, like, Nita tus calcetines. Okay, if you are not using shoes with socks, then think about your favorite socks and then draw them. And they draw them and they present it to the class and they I ask them questions and then they have to compare their socks with Neruda's socks. And then we talk about the structure, the comprehension of the Oda. And then they analyze, analyze each um, Estrofa. Then they have to do the same. They have to apply what they know about ODAs and the organization or the structure of the ODA in the internal and external um, the structure. So now let's go back to the landing page and if you click here participant template is going to ask you to make a copy. Okay? So you make a copy and then you are going to have a copy in your drive. And these are the this is the template that you are going to use for the planning time that you are going to have. So I'm going to go back to the slide. And then these are the instructions for the planning time. So for the first part, you are going to have 10 minutes to go to the participants template and only complete the things that are highlighted in green. Okay? You are going to do this in groups of two. Yeah. If you go to the folder that Jocelyn shared with you, is there? Uh, I see. And it's now in, in the folder? Okay, I can put it in the folder. Uh -huh, and template, see? And template is this one where it says template and ask you to make a copy. Okay, so I'm going to put it in the folder, but you know what you are going to do in the next 10 minutes, right? So you are going to go to the participant template. You are going to have 10 minutes to work with a partner and you are going to complete only the things that I highlighted in green. Okay? So 10 minutes and I'm going to upload the other one there. Do I have anyone that would like to share what they are doing so far? So, so far we have, um, we are doing the, um, the cooperation with the kids and the kids and the and the 616 and the students will be comparing contracts. They will be learning how to get ready for special events. So uh, 
nowadays some students like they have a topic like okay they want to dress up so quieren vestir um, las niñas eh, vaqueras o quieren eh, un topic o un un um, si un tema que quieren hacer en la fiesta de kisses o de what is that que los usos en el aquí se va a leer historia de la quinceañera y lo y cómo se festeja los 16 ya sea en, en la comunidad y hasta ahí vamos a so if you want to go if you are still working on that it's fine this is just for you to think about how you want to create your lessons and i was telling one of of you that this is just a template for you to use or not to use but for me it's very helpful to know like how these things align to my goal so the next part that you're going to be working on is the things that are in yellow so if you already complete the green or not you can continue uh, working on the green or you can go to the yellow can I have everyone's attention for a second? So when I said, uh, look at your um, pamphlet, is this one. So it tells you the license that you want to choose. You are going to choose how you want people to use your material. Like maybe you, you don't care if they sell them, but maybe you do. So when you look at this one, you are going to choose which one do you want. And if you don't know how to do it, uh, Jocelyn put in the folder that if you go there, uh, how to share your work. Okay, so there is something that is not in the folder, but I'm hearing a lot of conversations about this. So for high school, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know yet, we have a standardized set. Okay, so the students have to take the AP test if they are taking an AP class. If they are taking English one, they have to take the STAR test. So there is no going around. If they, if they want to graduate from high school, they have to take certain tests, even though we don't like students taking a standardized test, but that's the reality. So in college level, which is great, <laughs> Uh, you can do almost pretty much whatever you want with your course, right? You can create your own test. You can create your own activities. You can pick your own goals for the course uh, based on previous um, years or based on your coordinator. You have more flexibility. But that's not the reality in high school. So in high school, yes, students have to read Don Quixote. <laughs> Yes, students have to read Lazarillo de Torme. And sometimes even the teacher doesn't want to read it. So, so I was sharing with others that for Don Quixote, I get super excited and I bring like a source and I like dress and then like I'm so excited that I like it's very contagious for them to like, I'm so excited too. Even inside me, I'm like, I'm not that excited, but I'm going to play the role that I'm super excited, so you are excited as well. So you have to motivate the students. Yes, it is easier to show them a manual for haunted houses. That's very fun. It is not the same as um, Don Quixote. I like Don Quixote, but it's hard. The vocabulary is very archaic, and it's very difficult for the students to feel successful when they don't understand. So that being said, in my um, college class that I teach, I create my own syllabus and I create my own goals. And based on my experience with general-based instruction, I use, and I think we talk about this, I use children's books. Uh, I know the goal of my grammar advanced course is for the students to be able to apply all these concepts. So they know that it's grammar there. They know that they have to be able to show me that they understand these concepts at the end of the course. 
But it's also fun because we read children's books and we talk about social justice and we also talk about grammar. And how they show it to me is not through a test that they have to write an essay, but they create activities. Activities that high school teachers use. So what they do is as the same lesson that I create for them, they have created for other high school teachers. And they know at the beginning of the, um, of the course that they have to create activities for high school teachers. So what they have to do is they have to pick up a children's book different from the ones that we already read in class. They have to read the book. They have to do a summary. They have to um, get links about the author. They have to get links about topics, about the places that are named in the book. And they also have to create um, the questions that the teacher is going to ask the students based on those texts. And they have to create activities that are connected to the grammar concepts that we learn in class. So I told them, this is your final exam. See, so if you cannot create activities and you cannot do the activities, the grammar activities, then that means that you did not understand them. So it's 50% of your grade to be able to create these activities and be able to understand what kind of grammar concepts are in the text that you chose. Because I give them the freedom to choose what they want um, to do. So for example, one of the activities was define que es un artículo en cuatro, cuatro ejemplos and they pull up the examples from the text. So if they don't know what is an article and they don't know how to apply it, then they didn't understand what was an article, how to use it. And one of the activities that they also created is like they put the wrong articles and the student have to put the right articles, but they create the activities and they have to um, complete the activities themselves. So it's not only I'm going to create these activities uh, and then I'm not going to complete it, so they have to complete it. So I think that's the beauty of the college course, but we don't have that beauty everywhere. Um, so that's the, that's the difference. Uh -huh. So I work as a TA in Texas A&M, but I also coach high school Spanish student, um, teachers. So I, um, when I coach them and they're like, I don't know how to introduce this, it's like, you can use this book. And these are all these activities. You just need to adapt them to the student population that you have. But that is the baseline that they already have. So they are actually using what the students are creating. And then the students know this semester, but next semester I'm going to ask them, like, you need to put the, um, the license so I can put it in the website and I'm, everybody can give you credit of the work that you are doing. And they feel very successful, like, oh, somebody's actually using the materials that I'm creating. This one's no, because I did not ask the, the students. But I just wanted to show you um, what it does. But if you go to Dr. Zapata website, she has actually websites for children's books with exercises. So if you type Gabriela Zapata, I love Gabriela Zapata, but this is from Texas <laughs> and it's not none of them. So. If you go to Texas A&M, Gabriela Zapata, you can share that link, her personal link. But in her personal link, ah, okay. So if you go to the personal website, she is the one, oh, it doesn't work, but she's the one, she was my professor and she was my director of dissertation, but she's moving to another university. But she actually taught me everything that I know about general based instruction. So I want to give credit to her because she actually creates websites with all the student work, and the students are actually given um, the activities that you can use. So if you go to the, I'm going to look for the website, and I'm going to upload it there, so you can see all the activities that she has uh, that are um, OER material, so you can use. 
Well, thank you very much for everything. It was a pleasure.